Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to begin talking about specific endocrine structures, namely the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So let's just quickly review the location of these two structures. If we consider the brain, we know that we have the cerebellum, the cerebrum, and the brainstem as the primary structures, and then also we'll just label the thalamus, and um, then we can look at the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So this is a, a mid-sagittal section of the brain and the brainstem. And we can see that the hypothalamus is inferior to the thalamus and the pituitary gland is anterior to the brainstem. The pituitary gland has two components, the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. So we consider the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland first because of the hierarchy of endocrine controls. So the hypothalamus is the highest level of control and it exerts its control over the pituitary gland and then the pituitary gland will exert its control over the other uh, peripheral organs and, and um, some tissues and cells. So the hypothalamus is an important link between the nervous system and the endocrine system and it does three important things. One, it secretes regulatory hormones into the anterior pituitary and we'll get into the specifics of these in a couple of moments. Two, it synthesizes ADH and oxytocin and releases them from the posterior pituitary. And three, it contains autonomic nervous system centers that innervate the adrenal medulla. So anytime we have sympathetic activation, we will be able to modulate the activity of the adrenal medulla and increase the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine into the bloodstream. So each one of these requires more detail, and we'll get to that shortly. Um, moving down, though, the anterior pituitary's functions. So the anterior pituitary releases peptide hormones that bind to receptors on peripheral endocrine organs. So since they're all peptide hormones, they're all water-soluble, and they work by second messenger. And when they communicate with these peripheral endocrine organs, the organs will synthesize and release additional hormones, and those hormones can regulate the activity of the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary by negative feedback. The, now the posterior pituitary is simply going to release the ADH and oxytocin that is synthesized by the hypothalamus and those hormones will affect distant tissues. And so what we're going to do now is just sort of draw the specific pathways that allow for each of these types of communication to occur. So we'll start with the anterior pituitary and we'll describe endocrine axis driven negative feedback. So we mentioned this in a prior video as one of the two types of negative feedback that exerts control in the, the, the endocrine system. And this axis, um, we basically take the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and then the peripheral endocrine organ that is the target of the pituitary hormone. And there's an axis between those three structures that allows for the regulation of specific hormones. So we'll just draw the uh, a blow up version of the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland. And in the hypothalamus, there are hypothalamic neurons. So the hypothalamus is a neural structure, so it would make sense that there are neurons present. And there's also going to be a blood supply. And what we're gonna do is just draw in some capillary vessels here. So there, So there is going to be blood flow into the hypothalamus, but any type of exchange that's going to occur between the hypothalamus and the blood supply, if any chemicals could transfer into the blood or any chemicals could transfer out of the blood, etc., we have to be at the capillary level in order for that exchange to occur. So we will have a capillary network in the hypothalamus that is in close proximity to the synaptic knobs of the hypothalamic neurons. And then we're gonna introduce something called a portal vessel. And in this case, it's going to be the hypophysial portal vessel. So I'm going to explain portal vessel, but also we'll just name this one in particular the hypophysial portal vessel. And then we have another capillary network. So typically, the flow of blood is from artery to arteriole to capillary to venule to vein. It's a little bit more rare, and we really haven't ever discussed this before, to think about a capillary network that's connected to another vessel that's connected to another capillary network. Um, that, that doesn't really, that's kind of an anomaly. And there are three examples of portal vessels that we're gonna consider in the human body 
and this is the first one. So when we have two capillary networks joined by a blood vessel, um, specifically called a portal vessel, we call that a portal system. And so in this particular case, we're gonna name it the hypophysial portal system. And the reason for that is that the more correct scientific term for the pituitary gland is the hypophysis. So what we're gonna have is release of some chemicals, and in this case, it's gonna be hormones from those hypothalamic neurons. So typically we would have referred to this as neurotransmitter, but now because we're talking about endocrine system, we're gonna call them hormones even though they're coming from the neurons. And so they're going to be released into the bloodstream. And this is the, that's the biggest difference is that it's being, being released into the bloodstream for transport is what makes it a hormone anyway. So chemicals are released into the bloodstream and then they travel via the hypophysial portal system to the anterior pituitary. So what's happening here is that we are ensuring that the regulatory hormones that are released from the hypothalamus are transported directly to the anterior pituitary. So if we didn't have a portal system, we would be at the capillary level exchanging and taking in those hormones and then we would have to go back to the heart and then be recirculated again. And we don't want that because if we did that, then the, the specific regulatory hormones that were released from the hypothalamus would be able to travel anywhere in the body and affect any tissues. And we wanna make sure that in their concentrated form, as many as there are being released, they are going directly to their target tissues, which is the anterior pituitary. So next, let's just draw some cells of the anterior pituitary. We're not going to get into any specifics about what they look like, but there are um, five different cell types, and they're all in the epithelial cell family. And in the anterior pituitary, the hormones that traveled via the hypophysial portal system can move out of the second capillary network because, again, exchange occurs at the capillary level, and they're able to interact with the cells of the anterior pituitary. So before we get too much further, I want to just um, explain a little bit more about this process. So the hypothalamic hormones can be uh, either releasing hormones or inhibiting hormones. And so it's just two sort of classifications of hormone, but if it's a releasing hormone, it's going to stimulate the anterior pituitary. And if it's going to, if it's an inhibiting hormone, it will inhibit the anterior pituitary. So we say that these releasing hormones or inhibiting hormones, so the hypothalamic hormones, they're going to be released into the blood at that first capillary network and travel via the, to travel to the anterior pituitary via the hypophysial portal system. Then the anterior pituitary is going to respond to these hormones and um, the releasing hormones, which we said are, are stimulatory to the anterior pituitary, will trigger the synthesis and release of the anterior pituitary hormones. Now, one sort of minor clarification is that the anterior pituitary will have a lot of hormones on hand already, and so really the arrival is going to trigger release and then uh, the arrival of the hypothalamic hormone will trigger the release and then subsequent synthesis, so we'll make up for what we've kind of given away. The anterior pituitary hormones are referred to as tropic hormones, and um, these hormones will be released into the bloodstream in response to releasing hormones from the hypothalamus. So again, exchange occurs at the capillary level. The tropic hormones are now transported in the blood, and they will travel to peripheral endocrine organs. So it's going to be um, different depending on which hormones we're talking about. Once the tropic hormones interact with the peripheral endocrine gland or organ, they will cause the release of additional hormones. And those hormones can affect target cells, um, and we'll specify what those cells are, and it is dependent upon the hormone. And those hormones, the ones in pink now, are also going to provide negative feedback control to both the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. So what that means is that the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary both contain receptors for the hormones just the same as the target cells for those particular hormones do.
So this is our endocrine axis driven negative feedback process. Release from the hypothalamus, release from the anterior pituitary, release of hormones from the peripheral endocrine organ or gland, and then those hormones in adequate concentration will provide negative feedback to the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary so that there is no longer release of additional hormone. And then if the levels of the hormone drop, then the negative feedback is inhibited and we will get a repeat of this entire process. I feel that this is a little bit overwhelming to take it all in like this. So we're gonna do a couple of examples. We're gonna show the different anterior pituitary hormones and how they respond to hypothalamic hormones and how they affect peripheral endocrine organs and what hormones are released. And I think that once we start to see this pathway, it will start to come together a little bit more. So we'll start by describing the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. So when we say axis, there's always going to be three parts, as we mentioned, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and then another, the specific peripheral endocrine organ. And the hormones that go with this axis are specific. So the hypothalamus is going to, um, the neurons are going to synthesize TRH, which is thyrotropin-releasing hormone. And remember that these neurons are able to um, synthesize these hormones because in their cell bodies, they're going to have a nucleus and endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi and all the structures that are necessary for synthesis of proteins or other similar chemicals. And so these hormones, like such as TRH, can be transported um, down the axon um, using um, the microtubules and specific um, transporters. And once they arrive at the um, synaptic knob, they're just waiting for release and the action potential will release these hormones um, from the hypothalamus. So TRH is gonna be released into, uh, released from the hypothalamus into the hypophysial portal system. So we didn't drop, but remember there's a capillary network right there. And TRH is gonna hop into the capillary network and it's gonna travel down the hypophysial portal system and it's going to arrive at the anterior pituitary, which will trigger the release of and subsequent synthesis of TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone is a tropic hormone. It's going to be released into the bloodstream. It will travel to the thyroid gland because that's its target organ. And the, the thyroid gland will then release and subsequently produce the hormones that it's responsible for, which is T3 and T4. Now, T3 and T4 are going to affect their target cells, but also the circulation of T3 and T4 in the bloodstream will allow for it to circulate to the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary and interact with receptors that are present at both of those sites. So when T3 and T4 are in adequate concentrations, they exert negative feedback control on the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus meaning that if there's enough T3 and T4, there will not be any more production of TRH and TSH or, re or release. But if we're deficient in T3 and T4, then we will get release of more TRH followed by more TSH to replenish the, de the decrease in T3 and T4 in the blood. So now we'll move on and talk about uh, the next axis. That is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. From the hypothalam hypothalamic neurons, we'll get release of CRH, which is corticotropin releasing hormone. And CRH will be released into the capillary network and will travel via the hypophysial portal system to the anterior pituitary, where it will trigger the release and subsequent synthesis of ACTH which is adrenocorticotropic hormone, and ACTH will be released into the bloodstream, travel to its peripheral endocrine organ, which is the adrenal cortex, and at the adrenal cortex, it will trigger the release of cortisol, and cortisol will exert its effects on peripheral uh, target cells, and it will cause negative feedback inhibition in adequate concentrations to the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. Next is the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis and the hypothal hypothalamic pituitary testes axis. 
So from the hypothalamus, we get release of GnRH, which is gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Enters into the capillary network and travels via the hypophysial portal system to the anterior pituitary, where we will get release and subsequent synthesis of FSH and LH. FSH is follicle-stimulating hormone, and LH is luteinizing hormone. So both of these hormones are released from both males and females, and their specific functions will differ, but they're both considered um, anterior pituitary tropic hormones that will affect the sex organs. So FSH and LH in females is released into the bloodstream, travels to the ovary, where the ovary will then produce and release estrogen and progesterone. These hormones target um, specific cells, and in adequate concentrations, they will exert negative feedback control on the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. Now, in contrast, if it's a male, GnRH is released from the hypothalamus, FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary, and then they travel in the bloodstream and arrive at the testes where they will cause a synthesis and release of testosterone, which will affect target cells and exert negative feedback control on both the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. Next, we'll consider the hypothalamic pituitary liver axis. And this is actually the last axis that we're going to discuss. It's the last one that exists. And in this case, this one is a little bit more complicated. So um, we're going to sort of add another layer of control here. So we'll start with GHRH from the hypothalamus, growth hormone releasing hormone. And growth hormone releasing hormone is going to travel via the hypophysial portal system to the anterior pituitary which will cause this, the release and subsequent synthesis of GH, which is growth hormone, also called somatotropin. Now, growth hormone is going to be released into the bloodstream, travel to the liver, and the liver will subsequently release IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor. And IGF-1 will affect target cells, and it will also, in adequate concentrations, inhibit by negative feedback control the anterior pituitary and hypothalamus, the release of GHRH and GH. Now, as I mentioned, there's another layer of control. There's another hormone, um, in this case from the hypothalamus, called uh, GHIH, which is growth hormone inhibiting hormone. Earlier, we mentioned that there could be releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones from the hypothalamus, and up to this point, we've only seen releasing hormones. But now we're seeing an example of an inhibiting hormone that's also released in addition to the growth hormone releasing hormone. So the growth hormone inhibiting hormone is also called somatostatin. And so let's just draw on the pathway for, for this hormone. So IGF-1 is actually going to um, trigger the release of growth hormone inhibiting hormone. And then growth hormone inhibiting hormone will exert negative feedback control on growth hormone. Okay, now for the very last hormone that comes from the anterior pituitary that we're going to consider, which is prolactin, um, this, is a, this is not an axis, and it's not an axis because the target tissues for prolactin are not endocrine tissue. So it just this is just a hormone that's released from the anterior pituitary that has some control from the hypothalamus, but there's nothing else happening with a peripheral endocrine organ. So a prolactin is PRL, and it's actually responsible for milk letdown, so it triggers mammary glands. Um, so this is particularly for, um, you know, mom who just um, is breastfeeding, just delivered baby, that sort of thing. So prolactin is released into the bloodstream to travel to its target tissue, which is the mammary glands, and then also the concentration of prolactin will then trigger the release of, inadequate concentrations will trigger the release of something called uh, PIH, which is prolactin inhibiting hormone. And as it turns out, prolactin inhibiting hormone is actually dopamine. And, um, and so when there is adequate PRL, PIH is released and exerts negative feedback towards the prolactin. Now there is also evidence of a prolactin releasing factor, um, which so it would be sort of equivalent to a releasing hormone, which will trigger increased release of prolactin, and then when there's adequate prolactin, will exert negative feedback to the prolactin releasing factor. But it's secondary to the 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 role of dopamine in controlling prolactin and milk letdown.
So that covers the anterior pituitary. And now we're just going to do the posterior pituitary. And it's like a tiny bit of information in comparison to the anterior. So the posterior pituitary gland is, um, is neural tissue. And so really what I want to show here in this drawing is that there are neurons that start in the hypothalamus. Um, they have their cell bodies in the hypothalamus. And then they have their, um, their axons travel down the connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland and end in the posterior pituitary. So these are neurons that, that are, um, they extend the distance between the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary. And so they're considered part of both. And there are two types of neurons. Supraoptic neurons are responsible for synthesis of antidiuretic hormone. And then paraventricular neurons are responsible for synthesis of oxytocin. So just two hormones uh, here and, um, same thing they're going to be synthesized in the cell bodies and then the hormones once they're they're synthesized will travel down the axon and sort of hang out in the synaptic knob so same thing that would happen with neurotransmitters before and then an action potential will cause a release of the hormones into the bloodstream so you can see that there's capillary network that's present in the posterior pituitary to receive these hormones as they're released and then they'll travel to distant tissues so ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone. It's also called arginine vasopressin. And yes, it's the same hormone that can be administered as a drug by IV. So this hormone is released in response to an increase in electrolyte concentration or increased po uh, plasma osmolarity, um, increased osmotic pressure, or decrease in blood volume. and it leads to a decrease in water loss in the urine or increased water reabsorption. And in very high concentrations, it's responsible for uh, peripheral vasoconstriction. Also, the release of antidiuretic hormone is inhibited by alcohol. So we'll consider antidiuretic hormone again when we discuss the kidneys. And then oxytocin, um, which is abbreviated OT, stimulates smooth muscle contractions in the wall of the uterus during labor and delivery. It also participates in milk letdown during breastfeeding, and it may potentially have a role in sexual arousal in both males and females. So that concludes our overview of the hierarchy of the endocrine system and the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. And um, what's in store is a more specific discussion about the thyroid gland, the parathyroid glands, the adrenal glands, both the adrenal medulla and the adrenal cortex, and also the pancreas. Um, and then everything else is going to be left for other body systems. All right. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.